Hello, this is Leadership Live. I'm David Rubenstein. And on this show, I've been talking to a number of CEOs from their home. Uh, I am coming from my home in Maryland. And today we're very fortunate to have the CEO of YouTube, Sue Wojcicki, and she's coming from her home in California. Sue, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So let me ask you if this is the best of times or the worst of times for companies like YouTube, the best of times because you've got a captive audience, everybody seems to be at home, the worst of times because advertisers are not advertising quite as much. So which is it for you? Uh, probably both. Uh, it's definitely a very difficult time for everyone. And we see how much uh, difficulty there has been with COVID-19 across the board. On the other hand, we've seen that YouTube has a really important role to play which has been delivering the right information to people associated with COVID-19, um, connecting them to their communities with so many people at home and isolated. YouTube has really been able to connect people, whether it's a religious, social, um, or information. Uh, people are looking for, how do they fix something in their house? Um, we see so many kids out of school. Um, so YouTube has been an incredibly important resource in homeschooling. But on the other hand, it's a very tough time economically, and we're certainly seeing the challenges across the board. And um, you know, but we're working hard to make sure that our creators can continue to generate revenue well, and um, and that we provide a valuable service for our users. So today is also a day that the social media is in the news because President Trump has signed, I guess, an executive order in effect saying that the government might do more to regulate social media companies. Uh, do you have any comment on that? Well, we've heard that this executive order is coming out soon. I think really um, any minute now, um, probably during this interview. So we haven't had a chance to see it, but I'll certainly say we take all concerns very seriously and want to make sure that we understand what the concerns are and that we're addressing them. But we have worked extraordinarily hard to make sure that all of our policies and systems are built in a fair and neutral and consistent way. Um, we're a global company, so all of our policies are done at a global level. Um, they're enforced at a global level. And, um, and if someone has an issue in terms of how we've handled their specific video, they can always appeal. I will say that I think YouTube and the social platforms have really enabled a broad set of new voices to come um, and join the conversation. And we've been really proud that across the spectrum, we see a lot of new voices and a lot of new opinions. So uh, YouTube has had its own challenges in this area. I think the social uh, media uh, executive order is probably due to the fact that Twitter made some comments about President Trump's statements the other day, but uh, you have been uh, in the news in something that happened in China. Uh, in China, you have been uh, accused, if that's the right word, or of, for, of, of commenting or taking some words down from a YouTube uh, video that was relating to China. Is there anything you can say about that or is that not true? Well, we had an issue. It was, a, it was an error on our side. Um, and when we were made aware and understood what was happening, we immediately pushed a change to our system to address that. And we did issue a statement saying that it had been a mistake on our side and that we were fixing it and addressing it. So there's also been a doctor that recently got a fair amount of attention for his YouTube uh, presentations on healthcare and some relating to some medicines relating to COVID-19. And at one point, I think you took down some of his videos, and then you put them back up. So is that a kind of problem you always have to, to verify the accuracy of what somebody is saying? Well, I'm not sure which doctor that was. Um, there certainly have been a few videos that have been in the news, but I can just say overall that, uh, first of all, we've enabled a large amount of debate and discussion associated with COVID-19, but we've also had some really clear policies. Uh, and so the policies have been that if someone is recommending any kind of treatment that would be harmful, like bleach or um, something that we know would lead to a bad outcome, that would be a violation of our policy. Anything that would cause people to have to take medically unsubstantiated treatments, so someone theorizing about some treatment, that would be a violation of our policy. And so we have seen um, different individuals who have posted videos um, and that have violated those two, uh, those two um, policies. And as a result, we have taken them down. Let me ask you, uh, we I... do. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that um, if, if, the, if a news organization is covering it, uh, then it could be reinstated 
because it's got context and there's news associated with it, but just a video by itself of someone speaking into the camera saying, take this medicine or um, the, and, and that's something that we know is medically unsubstantiated. Um, and again, we consult with many experts, all kinds of local health authorities around the world, um, then that would be something that would be a violation and we would take it down. So somebody that's not an expert in how YouTube works, uh, can you explain this? Um, you have how many hours a day of video going on in any given uh, day? So we have 500 hours uploaded every minute to YouTube. Uh, so we have huge amount of volume of video coming in. We have over 2 billion users coming to our site every single month. Um, and so we just have an incredible amount of video across the board and an incredible amount of, of users. And so we see a lot of responsibility with that to make sure that we are enabling both a broad set of views, but also have the right policies in place. So how do you, how do you get all these people to watch everything that's going on. In other words, does somebody have to complain or how many do you have like 50,000 people to just watch everything to say, this is okay, it's not okay. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's part of the, um, uh, that's part of the solutions that we have. And I'll summarize it by saying that we use a combination of humans and machines. And so basically you can think about it that we use the humans to come up with the policies. We consult a broad set of people on those policies. Um, and then we train our machines to go out and look for videos that could be violations of that policy. Um, and so you can think about it, they cast a net, they go out and they bring back all these videos and then we have the humans actually review the videos and say, this is violative, this is not violative. And we do a lot of training to make sure that there's consistency in terms of I how see. our policies work. Okay, so let's talk for a moment about um, how you've been operating this company from home. Um, mm -hmm. How many total employees does YouTube have? So we don't release that actual number, but we do have thousands of employees and we okay. work with Google. Um, so there's some com some shared resources between YouTube and Google. Okay, well, however many you have, I assume you've got more than a hundred, let's say you've got a couple yes, thousand, thousand, whatever you have. Um, are they working mostly from home now or all at yes, home? Yes, so everyone is at home. And we, we are a global company, so we have operations around the globe. And there certainly is some, some countries where they, they might have slightly more people in the office, but I'd say for the most part, pretty much everybody is working from home. And I didn't think we could ever do that, but we, but we are. Now, a technology company like yours, and I think you'd be fair to say it's a technology company, people would presume, I assume, that you're able to operate from home better than a non-technology company. Is that a fair statement? And has it been a problem operating from home for your, your company? It, it will definitely took some adjustment, but there's truth in the fact that because we're a online and software company, it's easier for us to work from home. But there are definitely going to be tech companies where they produce hardware, for example, where they'll have a lot of equipment. Um, they'll need to have, people will need to come into the office. And, but for us, for the most part, um, it's been very, our employees have been able to successfully work from home. Now, a couple of other uh, companies like yours, not quite like yours, but companies that uh, are social media companies have said, you know, in the future, we may have all of our employees staying at home, maybe working at home completely. Twitter, I think, has said that. I think Facebook had said maybe in 10 years, 50% will be working at home. Do you have a policy on whether it might be better to bring everybody back or it might be better to keep everybody at home? Or what is your policy on that? We haven't made a policy on that, but we have said that we certainly will be looking at more flexibility and what we learn from this um, situation. And we certainly have seen that we can continue to uh, operate our company very effectively. We can do all hands across the entire company. Um, and so I think it definitely pushed the limits of what we thought we could do. So today, I assume you talk to your, your senior reports once a day or is it once a week? Or how have you changed the way you manage your company from, from your home? In many ways, it's the same. Um, the challenge is there aren't those casual bump into each other in the hallway conversations. So I just need to make sure I'm being really deliberate. And for my key uh, key staff members, I need to make sure that I have time set up to work with, uh, to meet with every single one of them on some regular frequency. Uh, so, but for the most part, I'd say, you know, there's just, there, there's actually a lot fewer uh, talks to give um, and a lot less travel. Um, but internally, we're able to operate a lot of our regular meetings in the same way that we were in the past. So um, you, you global. 
So we always had people who were on um, video conference in all of our meetings who were calling in from other locations. Now, how have you personally been taking care of your health? Are you um, wearing a mask uh, when you go out, if you go out, or you, you go visit anybody, or you just stay at home? You have five children. Are they all at home with you and your husband? Yeah. So it's definitely been, uh, uh, I think personally, it's hard to be at home. I think, and I think we're seeing that across the board. People want to get out and do things. Um, I personally have done a few things, which is I need to get outside of the house and whether it's walks or exercise, I find that's essential for me. I need that a couple times a day. Um, and actually YouTube has really great exercise routines and yoga routines for anyone, no matter where they are in the world or what kind of exercise they want, we have that on YouTube. And um, I, I uh, you know, I'm also just trying to remember that this will end, um, that we will get through it. Like any crisis, I think as a leader, we all go through crises and we know they do end. Um, and you, we just need to manage through it and make sure that we are doing, contributing back to society and doing our best to do that. But, um, and yeah, when I go outside, well, we have a mandate in the, in the county that I live in that when we ever, we go to the store or anything, we have to wear a mask. So that's required by, uh, the county officials. So to, for people that aren't familiar with your background, you grew up in around the Palo Alto campus. Your father was a professor there in physics and yes. you went to Harvard. And yes. you majored in English, among other subjects. Yes, yes. history and literature. Right. Okay. Yes. And then you came back, you got a master's at University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, yes. And then you got your MBA at UCLA. So if yes. you got your MBA at UCLA, you have your master's in economics, you have a literature degree, what were you deciding that you wanted to do? Well, I wasn't sure. That was part of the beauty of the journey. Uh, so we, I mean, the internet didn't exist when I went to college or even when I graduated from college or even when I graduated from my first graduate degree or it was just getting started um, or it was, certainly wasn't as we know it today. And um, so, but what happened was I saw a startup. So I, I actually, because I was from Palo Alto, I saw startups, I saw what they were doing. And I, I used to do temp work, I would come home from vacation, and I would just call up Kelly services and say, place me anywhere for a day or a few days. And I actually was placed at a startup. And I said, this is amazing. And I think I want to work in tech. And I went back and I took computer science at Harvard. And uh, um, just the, you know, two classes at computer science. And um, that changed my point of view. And I wound up working in tech. So it's been 30 years now in tech. So um, the story is, and it's an urban legend that you can tell us whether it's true or not. Uh, some two guys came along, they wanted to rent a garage for a company they were starting. You rented it to them for $1,300 a month or something like that. Um, and then, I mean, uh, that, is that right or not? 1700 yeah, $1,700 $1, a month. Okay. Yeah, how to um, get that $400 in there. All right, so you got $1,700 a month. And did you think they were good uh, bets? And did you think this company was going to go anywhere? Did you know what it was? This, of course, became uh, Google. But did you know these guys before? And how did you happen to come to them? Or they came I, to you? Well, I knew Sergey socially beforehand. Um, but I didn't really. He wasn't working on Google at the time. He was just a student. And yeah, then they said they were going to build this search engine. I was like, OK, whatever. Um, and there was already all these other search engines and they were, uh, Ink to me at the time was worth $20 billion. And so you have these two students saying, can I rent your house? And I want to build a service and it's going to compete with Ink to me. And I said, okay, well, as long as you pay the rent, like you can do whatever you want, as long as it's legal. Right. So, um, build whatever you, internet service you want. And so I just, I didn't take them seriously, but then what happened is I started using their service and. I didn't really realize, but I had completely switched to Google. And then there was one moment where I was trying to do my job and it actually was down because it wasn't, it was, wasn't really a really reliable service at that point. And I realized, wow, I, it's so much better. I can't get my work done. And that's when the light bulb really went off. And I said, if this service is helping me do my job better, then that's actually going to be something really valuable. And um, they're actually doing something interesting and maybe I should work there. Did they pay their rent on time actually every month? 
They did. They did. They paid their rent. They took out the recycling. Uh, they the 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 challenge was they stayed up really late and they were there a lot of times, sometimes all night. Um, and I didn't really plan for that because my bedroom was above their headquarters, and so, so that uh, caused a few issues. Now Hewlett Packard was allegedly started in a garage in Palo Alto as well. It was. And so, and this company, uh, Google was starting a garage. What is it about garages? Do people feel that there's something in the garage? Why not just rent an office building? What is it about a garage that people want to rent? Well, they couldn't rent an office building. That's why they rented part of our house is because it was during the first dot-com boom and it was really, really crowded. And so there just wasn't any office space available. And there were just three of them. And actually, when, the, when you're really small and you're working all the time, a house is actually a better work environment because a, they could move in right away. I said, like, I'm not going to charge you a one year lease. Um, and they had a shower and like my refrigerator was in the kitchen, in the garage. And that was a big bonus. And you don't get that in a regular office space. So they, they thought it was great. So uh, at one point you said, maybe I should join this company. It's gone somewhere. So were you the 16th employee or something like that? Yes. I was a 16th employee. All right. So um, is a cock. But if I joined a day earlier, I would have been the 12th or something. So the 16th employee, do you get a, do, do, do they um, say we want a discount on the rent now or do they stop renting from you or were you no. an employee when they're renting or? <laughs> they moved out when they oh. had about seven or eight employees. We both agreed. It, this was not the whole house where I lived and where they lived was under 2000 square feet. Okay. Um, it was residential and there's no parking on, uh, at night on in Menlo Park. And so we had a lot of parking issues. So after eight employees, we both agreed, yeah, we, we, you need to find real office space. Okay, so you joined the company and uh, presumably they didn't own YouTube then. So what were you doing yeah. in the early days? Well, I joined as, my title was marketing manager, but, and they said, we want you to build a global brand for Google, which at the time no one had heard of. Everyone just thought this was like, when they saw Google, they thought it was a kid's toy company. Um, so no one knew what it was. And they said, we want you to build this global brand and you have no budget to do that. And I was foolish enough and young enough to say, okay, I, I'll do that. Um, and so I, that's how I started out, but I realized that with no budget, I couldn't buy marketing or anything. And so I had to build product in order to make you to, to make Google known by other people. So, um, so anyway, we had a whole bunch of different products and strategies and that's how I wound up creating Thanks. product for Google. So it, the story is, I don't know, again, another urban legend that you saw YouTube, you said to Sergey and Larry, we should buy it. And you paid a price that many people thought was ridiculously high at the time, I think $1.65 billion. Yes. So um, what did you see in YouTube? And were you worried that you had overpaid for something that today is probably worth, some people would say $200 billion? Yes, I, I, um, was working in online video. So Google had its own product, which was Google video. And so I was starting to understand the dynamics. And w there were a few things that I saw that convinced me that this was going to be a really huge market. And the first was, is that people were uploading their video to share their story. So initially we just said, upload your video if you want. We didn't have any marketing or anything around it. And thousands of people all over the world uploaded video of their families or them or whatever uh, stuff they thought was interesting. And um, that wasn't that surprising, but the second part really surprised me, which is that uh, other people wanted to see regular people's uploads. Um, and you know, at the time, like user-generated content didn't exist, so people didn't know, like, is this something that no one wants to see or everyone wants to see? And it turns out, really, a lot of people want to see it. And so we realized this is a new type of video, and it's going to be successful. And uh, I thought it was really important that we were in that market. And so that's why in the end we acquired YouTube. And yeah, it was, I mean, it seemed really expensive at the time, but it was clear to me that this was going to be a huge market for us. So eventually they said to you, uh, you should be the CEO of YouTube. And yes. that's uh, how many years ago now? Uh, almost, I don't know, six or seven, six, six, or six, seven. Plus, six and a half. So the company has grown a lot. Explain to people that may not be that familiar with YouTube, you can upload your videos, but you can also subscribe to services. In other words, if somebody just wants to get your special services, your special videos, they can subscribe and pay a monthly fee. Is that right? Is that how it works? Well, so YouTube is free for everyone to watch the videos. And we have um, 2 billion people who come to our site every 
month and they can see videos on all kinds of topic, whether it's um, learning, how to, um, whether it's something funny, as well as traditional media who uploads all of their clips, sports, late night shows, um, as well as music. So we have a huge music collection um, and that's available to everybody for free. Um, and our, I think the one way to think about is that our creators are really like, um, and the people who create on, on YouTube, they started out as just people uploading videos of cats or dogs, but now they're actually professional. They're small creators. They're small businesses that create content. And a lot of them are doing extremely well, generating millions of dollars um, and millions of views. Um, so it's free for everybody. But then we have a music service, which is called YouTube Music. Um, and then we have a premium service, which is all of YouTube without ads, plus the music service. But how do people make money? But, but how do people make money on it? In other words, you charge advertisers, I presume, and that's where you get the bulk of your revenue, but you, you don't charge the, or do you charge the people that go on your service or how do, how do people get wealthy being on YouTube? So it's free for all of our users. So no matter who you are, you can see YouTube for free, but um, it's paid for by advertisers who advertise on videos bef uh, before the video. So before a video, there could be an ad that would run just like yeah. on TV. Um, or we may have videos advertising on our search results, for example. And then we share that revenue. So we share the majority of that revenue with our YouTube creators. So if you create videos, say about cooking um, and you generate a lot of page views, uh, we would pay you um, the majority of the revenue that we generate on the videos that we are serving for you. So whenever you go to a restaurant or anywhere, people come up to you and say, I have a perfect thing for YouTube and you should get me on. Do you get a lot of that or not so much? Uh, well, the good thing about YouTube is anyone can just upload, right? So they don't even need to talk to me. They can just open up their phone and hit. Uh, do you have algorithms that promote certain ones being more popular than others? How do you get in the... In the, in the business of being the high on the algorithms? You have people watch your content. Um, and so we have a lot of machine learning and it looks at lots of different criteria. For example, like how, how many people have watched the video, what kind of people watch the video, what, the, okay. what other videos they watched it with. So if we know you're interested in sailing and a new creator comes and creates a lot of sailing videos and we would likely recommend that to you because we know you're interested in sailing or we've just seen that you've watched other sailing videos. And when I say seen, I just mean our machines detect that um, so, and then um, it. Now, I suppose somebody um, is um, afraid that you might someday know all the things that they've been watching. Is that a risk that somebody has to, has to worry about? In other words, you can go on your computers and say, what is Joe Blow watching all the time? We know more about him than anybody. Is that a problem? No. So we work incredibly hard to make sure that we have privacy for all of our users. Um, and so, you know, we work across the board to make sure that um, all of that information is encrypted and stored in a confidential way. Mm -hmm. And we also give users a right to remove any information or any kind of uh, watch history that they wouldn't feel comfortable with us having as well. I see. Uh, now, your company's done very well by all analyst reports. Have you ever thought of going to Sergey or Larry I know they're not the CEOs now and say, look, why don't you just spin this off? Let me run the publicly traded company called YouTube and we don't have to be part of Google. Is that a chance that you would ever spin it off or you don't think that's likely? I don't think that's very likely. Uh, we're, we work pretty closely with Google and there's a lot of benefits that we get as being part of Google. So they sell our advertising, we run on their infrastructure. Um, and so from a, um, whenever we, like, like when we do things like search ranking, we can work with the search team. So there's a lot of benefits that we get in terms of being part of Google. So um, explain to me and to others who are watching something I, I guess I didn't really understand. What is it that YouTube have that was proprietary or um, that was a barrier to entry? In other words, did they have a patented technology that enabled people to go on and, and put things on this uh, site that nobody else could do? Or why, why don't you have 10 competitors or 20 competitors for almost your size? Good question. I, I, I think, so no, we don't have any special technology or traditional um, patent or anything that prevents other people. But what we do have is the fact that people know, we have communities. And I would say those communities are places where people come together. So if you, 
are a content creator and you create videos about um, yoga, for example, and then you start having millions of people who come and follow you, then you're going to, you're going to stay there and create, um, keep creating content because the users are there and the users are going to come because they're going to see, Oh, look, there are all these different yoga creators and I love doing yoga. I'm going to choose one of these. Right. So, now, so really the yeah. community. Now there's a company that's come along recently, a Chinese, based company called TikTok. Are they a competitor of yours in some ways or, or not? Well, I see them, there are many competitors. So this has become a really dynamic space. And I would say TikTok is one of many creators that we see. Uh, they're unique because they rose to um, a lot of uh, usage very, very quickly. Um, they also come from China, which has been unusual because the other competitors are mostly um, uh, US or European companies. So yeah, it's, and, and we do see that they've done a lot of innovative work. And I think there's always something to learn from the competitive marketplace and seeing how this market evolves. But yes, definitely they're, they're a competitor for watch time um, creators and advertising. So as you look at managing your company through COVID-19, is there anything you would have done differently in hindsight, how you manage the company remotely, or is there anything you've learned from the managing the company remotely that you will continue to do uh, when you don't have to manage it remotely? I would say the biggest thing we've learned is just that we can run the company entirely digitally. And uh, running our first all hands was, we, didn't, we weren't sure whether or not we could do that. Uh, we didn't think we could, have everybody working from home. But what I've seen as COVID-19 has really done is it's really accelerated our digital lives. And the, the fact that people are using um, digital solutions for going to school, right? That we see kids uh, doing that. We see people using it for telemedicine. A lot of medicine can that, you know, you don't necessarily always have to go in. You could just see, have talk to the doctor and them see it over the video. Um, so we've just seen an acceleration of our, our digital lives and I, YouTube has been part of that. So do you anticipate going to your landlord or Google's landlord and say, we don't really need all this office space in the future. So either give us a discount or we're going to get fewer spaces, uh, fewer space in the future. Well, there are definitely lots of benefits of coming into the office and seeing people. And I would say that Google employees, a lot of them really miss going into the office and the benefits that we have there. So I see that that will continue to be an important place for us once it's safe for everybody to go back, but maybe we'll have more flexibility. Like maybe people will not work every day at home. I mean, that could be something. We haven't really crossed that bridge yet, uh, but I think it's possible that we'll look at, we'll definitely look at these lessons and figure out how do we change our workforce? And I, I think going forward, we're gonna see a lot more remote workers and a lot more working from home because we did this big experiment and, and it proved that a lot of work can be done from home. So are your children happier to be with their parents uh, this much or not quite as happy as uh, you are? <laughs> um, I mean, there are definitely benefits of being able to see your family members a lot more and not having to compete with their friends. Uh, there are definitely a lot of benefits to that. But, uh, you know, I, I think I also, at some point you worry that kids need to get out and see their friends and socialize and do their activities. So. Um, it's been nice to see them, but overall, I hope we can all work through this COVID-19 quarantine and get out of it soon. So you have been very successful. Uh, obviously, you're one of the most successful and best known people in the technology world. YouTube is extremely successful. So are there other worlds you'd want to conquer? You could go into government, do politics, you could uh, do many other things. Are you happy to do what you're doing or do you ever anticipate doing something different in your professional life? I really enjoyed tech. Um, it continues to change and evolve. And I like the creative. I like how fast moving it is. And um, I really like media. So I see, I have enjoyed being where I, I am. Um, I'd say the one other space that has been really interesting to me has been medicine. And I've seen that actually a lot of the techniques and tools that we use with data science and with machine learning can start being applied to medicine to be able to better do better detection, um, figure out drug discovery, um, genetic analysis. So I, I see a lot of intersection and that would be one area. If I wasn't in media, I'd probably be interested in medicine. Let me ask you a final question. One of the uh, uh, things you're also well known for is you have two sisters who are also very accomplished. One is a uh, anthropologist and epidemiologist, Janet. Correct. And Anne, yeah. 
has also built a company called 23andMe. Your mother yep. has written a book about what it's like to raise three talented daughters. So what is the advice that you would give to others that your mother would give about what it takes to run, uh, to, to raise three talented uh, children? And are you using that advice for your own children? I'm trying to use the advice. It, it is hard, uh, but I would say the one thing my mom did really well is just believe in her kids and try to encourage what they are good at. And I, I think when you have kids, you always expect your kids to be like you and they never are like you. Um, they're always different and they have different interests. And uh, the best thing we can do is just support them to be the best they are um, with their own interests. But um, I think she also encouraged us to work hard um, and to ask lots of questions and not necessarily accept um, the known facts to always be right. She'd always ask us to, she, we would see her, she would just question lots of things that seemed established. And right. I think questioning, questioning, um, not always taking everything for granted, uh, those are really good skills. So I should have said at the beginning, uh, when you decided that you wanted to recommend buying YouTube, you should have suggested they change the name to SueTube because people would remember <laughs> that you know, it was your idea and actually you're the CEO. Do you ever thought of that? <laughs> No, I never thought of that. And I, there are no plans to change it to okay. suit you, but just, but thanks for the recommendation. Right, well, Sue, thank you very much for being on the show and thank you for uh, the great job you're doing at YouTube and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being Bye. on the show. Okay. Bye. Take care. Stay safe. All right.